Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we continue with the General Aircraft Showcase. Uh, today we actually have another custom built scenario. Uh, where is it? Here it is. And uh, we'll be doing the Blackburn Buccaneer today. The game lists it as the Bay Buccaneer because the company that made it Blackburn they were bought out by Hawker Sidley, famous for making the uh, Harrier. And that company, in turn, was eventually bought out by Bay. So they're referred to as in the game as the Bay Buccaneer, but um, I don't. Um, I don't know if Hawker had been bought out by Bay at, uh, by the time of their retirement. But in any case, we're kind of loosely simulating what they would have been used for way back in the day. So we have a wing of five Buccaneers. Um, the game does not, to my knowledge, have any British carriers. I was kind of looking through the object list. You can see there's a lot of pages here. Airports, apartments, and whatnot, but uh, I did. I saw the Clemenchu, or Clemenchot, I guess. Maybe that's a more French way of pronouncing it. But I did not see... Actually, I don't even know if they have any British warships. Um, for whatever reason, the French seem to be... Uh, like, Fr France, Russia, and the US. And I guess to a very limited extent, China seem to be... Oh, I didn't know they had variants for China and Egypt. I wonder what the difference is. Probably just the skin, but still. Um, but yeah. You can see, I mean, I'm looking through it now just to make sure I'm not insane, but I don't see a, um, any, is that Oleg, but okay. I, I thought that said Orlikin for a second, but yeah, to my point, I'm not seeing any British ships, let alone a carrier here, um. So unfortunately, we can't get the true British experience, um, but, you know, we'll make do. Uh, so basically, this mission I have set up as kind of a, an improvised NATO fleet. Actually, oh, you know what? Actually, I gotta change it. Because uh, I believe the Type 69A is supposed to be a, uh, a French ship, I think? Uh, where are you? There you are. So I'm gonna quickly replace those Noxes. So this is a very old, um... This is gonna be a very old <laughs> fleet, essentially. Um, but it's more in line with the era that the Blackburn would have operated in as a carrier aircraft. So we have the two Type 69s, which... To my knowledge, let me double check here. Type 69 Alpha Frigate. Yeah, the first result that comes back on Google is Destiné de Oves Classe Aviso. So it sounds like uh, some sort of light French frigate. So they're gonna. So we got kind of a NATO battle group here with the French Type 69s. Uh, I made the Clement show British because I could, uh, but then we have German Knox frigates because I think they use the Knox or a variant of it. I actually I should double check that now. Um, Charles F. Adams class destroyer. I know for a fact they use those. Um, let's see. I know we've sold the Knox to other countries. Oh, what do you know? Uh, I don't think uh, Germany was one of those. Oh well. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, it's, I see Greece, Turkey, Taiwan, Thailand. Um, I think Mexico might have some. Or did at one time. Uh, Egypt. Well, that's a little bit of a letdown. I don't think the trial. We'll see. Maybe Charles F. Adam is in here, but I don't think it is. Um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I... No, it's not in here. So we'll just pretend there are local Charles F. Adams. And then we have an American Tycho to round out our 
whole NATO battle group here. With the client just standing in for the uh, Arc Royal. Actually, that would make the Ticonderoga um, way too modern, but we'll, let's not think about this too closely. In any case, we have our five Bucanias, and we will be simulating a strike on three Krivak class frigates, which I'm going to move in a little closer to each other. And this is mostly a set-piece battle. It should be pretty easy, all things considered. I'm not bothering with the intricacies of setting up um, an air battle around us on top of the Kravax. We're just going to go in and bomb them, and that'll be that. And yes, I will save these latest mission changes. So, obviously, Mavericks weren't really in their wheelhouse back in the day, but I think we can make it do. Um, on the fuselage, I will be taking a 2,000 pound bomb, though, as a bit of insurance that, um, we'll be able to nail these Krivaks, because I don't know exact. I think Mavericks do a fair bit of damage to the Krivaks, but I can't quite remember. So I figure I'll play it safe, and this way we should have enough bombs alone to sink the Krivaks, because 2,000 pound bombs should go right through her, but I guess we'll find out. So with that, let's dive in and begin. Alright, and I do have autopilot on board, but I'm not going to enable it just because it'll be faster to uh, fly us in manually, actually. And we'll start off by selecting our bomb, and uh, as you can see we're about 40 miles out from the enemy Krivax. Now, uh, the, Black Look, the Blackburn Buccaneer was a British carrier capable attack aircraft that was designed in the 1950s for the Royal Navy because they needed a strike aircraft. Um, oh, there goes our drop tanks. And we have the Krivax coming up. Uh, but following the end of the Second World War, uh, as priorities shifted, the uh, Royal Navy needed an aircraft, that, a modern aircraft that could fly from their carriers and um, respond to the threat posed by the Soviet Navy. Mostly, most notably the Serdlov class, or the Serdlov class, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. Uh, they were technically light cruisers, but they were equal to pretty much any cruiser the British had at that point, which by that point their most modern cruisers were light cruisers. <laughs> uh, and a good chunk of their heavy cruisers were actually sunk in the war. For whatever reason, the British just kind of stopped building heavy cruisers. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe, maybe it was budgetary, maybe it was, um, you know, uh, doctrinal. But they just kind of stopped producing, uh, heavy cruisers so and you know obviously you want some overmatch uh, oh fuck I should have had my brakes on this whole time well we get to and I missed holy shit anyways we get to do this again but we'll do it smarter okay which is fine because this is actually going to be a very long Unfortunately, it's going to be a bit of a longer um, playthrough, so I do need the extra time. Um, but yeah, I, silly me forgot to extend the dive brakes, as it were, even though it's not really a dive bomber. But, but anyways, the, their main concern was that the... Uh, the Serdlovs would fill a similar role as the uh, Deutschland class did in the um, Second World War, acting as surface raiders that could sneak behind NATO sea lines and sink uh, transport convoys heading to Britain and Europe. So instead of building a new ship to counter these, the Royal Navy decided, fuck it, we'll put some aircraft on a carrier and call it a day. So they figured. Hey, if we have strike aircraft with conventional or nuclear weapons, that should be good enough. So a detailed specification was issued in June 1952, and at this point, gun the gun was still king, 
but missiles were starting to become more prolific at this time. I think by this time, the Navy, I think most countries were at least working on an effective surface air missile system. Uh, the Navy might have even deployed one by that point, because they obviously had a vested interest in protecting their very expensive ships. U.S. Navy, that is. I mean, obviously all navies, but the U.S. Navy especially, since they built up so many heavy ships to counter the Japanese during World War II. And uh, they had experience with losing big ships and did not like it, as you may imagine. So, Naval Staff Requirement NA-39 was issued, calling for a two-seat aircraft with folding wings, capable of flying at 550 knots at sea level with a combat radius of 400 nautical miles at low altitude and 800 nautical miles at higher cruising altitude. Weapons load of 8,000 pounds was required, including conventional bombs, red beard, free fall nuclear bombs, or the green cheese anti ship missile. That is a very, very interesting name for a missile, and uh, apparently was not built either. Um, based on the requirement, the Ministry of Supply Issued Specification M148 Tango in August 1952. And the first responses were returned in February of 1953. Blackburn's design by Barry P. Late, Project B-103, won the tender in July of 1955. And for reasons of secrecy, it was called the Blackburn Naval Aircraft or the Blackburn Advanced Naval Aircraft in documents leading to the nickname Banana Jet. first prototype made its maiden flight from RAE Bedford on 30th April 1958. And the first production model, the Buccaneer S-1, entered squadron service with the Fleet Air Arm in January 1963. It was powered by a pair of the Havilland Gyron Jr. triple jets producing 3,100 pounds force of thrust. But this first version was a bit underpowered, and as a consequence, it, could actually, it actually couldn't take off from the carrier if it was fully laden with both fuel and ammunition. So, a temporary solution was a buddy system where they would uh, kind of take off with minimal fuel but full weapons, and then they'd rendezvous with a supermarine scimitar that would deliver the rest of the fuel by aerial refueling. However, the loss of an engine on takeoff or landing at full load, the aircraft uh, couldn't recover from an engine failure um, or any other catastrophe. It was complete, almost completely dependent on control surfaces to increase drag in the event of, say, a landing. Long-term development was the develop, or uh, long-term solution to the development was the Buccaneer S2, which was fitted with a Rolls-Royce Bay engine, which provided 40% more thrust, which solved the uh, the issues with uh, being underpowered. And as a um, as another upside, it also had significantly lower fuel consumption than the Gyron which had the effect of improving its range. The engine itself had to be enlarged to accommodate the Spay, and the wing required minor aerodynamic modifications as a result. And you can see, with these big guys, we are definitely flying the S2, which makes sense. They would have been the only ones really still flying by the time this game came out. And, um... So the first production order for these S2s was placed in January 1962, and all squadrons converted to the S2 by the end of 1966. However, 736 Naval Air Squadron continued to use eight S1 aircraft taken from storage to meet training demands uh, for RAF crews until December of 1970. The South African Air Force also ordered some of these aircraft, having 16 aircraft ordered in October 1962. Um, they were the S2 type, with the addition of Bristol Sidley BS-605 rocket engines to provide additional thrust for hot and high African airfield takeoffs. And, the, and this variant was designated the S-50. This was also equipped with a strengthened undercarriage and higher capacity wheel brakes, and with manually folded wings. And they are equipped to use the AS-30 command guided um, air-to-surface missiles, and due to the need to patrol the vast coastline of South Africa, they were also um, specified to use aerial refueling and larger 430 gallon underwing tanks. 
the BS-605 rocket engines ended up proving unnecessary and were eventually removed from all aircraft. In South Africa wanted more, but uh, by that point they had their whole civil war thing. Well, it was a civil war and a war with Angola and apartheid and all that, so uh, they kind of weren't popular <laughs> at that time, so they weren't able to get any more um, any more uh, Buccaneers from the British. And now I will commence my attack run on the... There we go. I think... I have a good feeling about this one. I sh oh, wow. <laughs> Way off. Oh, she took a lot of hits, a lot of damage from that, even though it was a near miss. I'll take it. Our wingman should be able to deal with the uh, other Kravax easily enough. And uh, fortunately, their anti aircraft armament is light enough that they. Yeah, about four Mavericks to a Kravac. That's fair. Uh, but yeah, if I could, if I could have managed to hit it with that bomb, oh boy, there would be, there would have been fireworks. All right, there we go. Line her up. We don't have an IR pod, so we can just let loose. And there they go. So I'm just using the Maverick here to kind of. Oh, I did not need to use that second Maverick. Holy shit. Alright. We gotta... Keep our wingmen on target here. As I think they're trying to... Okay, I... There we go. Okay, they're firing again. Wow, the missiles are just going right. All right, fortunately, uh, oops, all right, anyone got, like, one more missile? Really, you're not going to use your bombs? Well, that makes this a lot less fun. The A6s don't have problems using their bombs against, <laughs> against, uh, surface ships, but, all right. If that's how it's gonna be, then fuck it, I'll do it myself. So we'll just uh, do a cheat reload here. And uh, what's our range to target? Six miles? Uh, that should be close enough to in range. Oh, uh, maybe not. No, it's leveling out. I think it has it. Uh, thankfully, we got the uh, onboard IR seeker. Ooh, it might come a, a little short. Nope. Ooh, and did you see how it peaked up at the end to, uh, the kind of attack the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, um, the conning tower of the Kravak. That was, uh, interesting to say the least. Ideally, my wingman will at least give me some cover here. We're gonna make a, uh, different bombing run this time instead of just coming in for, uh, a straight dive bomb. Oh, now they want to drop their bombs. Yeah, see, he he scored a direct hit there, and that thing's almost done for. Actually, it looks like our wingman's making another pass, so you can just barely see his bomb there, and he is out of there. Okay, he's had enough. Oh, disengage, everyone. And we will, uh, we are going to head back home. All right, mission successful. So this is kind of what combat would have looked like in the 50s, uh, naval combat that is from a uh, naval aircraft. Or really, your only effect, you know, at the time, you're, you're, you still would have been using World War II style bombs, rockets, um, torpedoes. But you're facing ships equipped with radar-guided anti-aircraft weapons. But you yourself have the advantage of uh, jet engines, so it would have uh, certainly been interesting to watch, um, to say the least. But we will switch over to navigational mode.
Uh, now getting back to the history, Blackburn tried to sell the Buccaneer to the Royal Air Force uh, between 57 and 58 in response to Air Ministry Operational Requirement OR339 for the replacement of the RAF's English Electric Canberra Light Bombers. Um, they were asking for a thousand nautical mile radius and supersonic speed as well as an all-weather aircraft that could deliver nuclear weapons over a long range and operate at high level Mach 2 or low level at Mach 1.2 with stole performance. The Blackburn proposed two designs, the B-103A, which was just a modification of the Buccaneer S-1 with more fuel, and the B-108, which was a more extensively modified aircraft with more sophisticated avionics. Against background of inner service distrust, political issues, and the 1957 defense white paper, both types ended up being rejected uh, because they were firmly subsonic and incapable of meeting the RAF's range requirements uh, in the case of the S-1, while the B-108 uh, would still have been severely underpowered and had poor short takeoff uh, performance. So the British Aerospace Corporation, I think that's what BAC is, uh, TSR-2 was eventually selected in 1959, a British Aircraft Corporation. So, after the cancellation of the TSR-2 and then the cancellation of the substitute American General Dynamics F-111K, the Royal Air Force still needed a replacement for Canberra's in the low levels strike role, while the plan of retirement for the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers meant that the RAF would also need to add a maritime strike capability. So the RAF adopted in 1968 the Buccaneer by purchasing a couple new build aircraft as well as taking over the fleet air arms Buccaneers as the car carriers were retired. They ended up purchasing 46 new builds, uh, which by this point was built by Hawker Sidley as they had acquired Blackburn, and these were designated the S-2B, and these had some minor modifications, such as RAF-style communications and avionics equipment, compatibility for the Martell air-to-surface missile, and they could be equipped with a bulge bomb bay door containing an extra fuel tank. Some fleet air arm buccaneers were modified in service to also carry the Martell anti-ship missile, and these aircraft were redesignated the S-2D. Remaining aircraft uh, were redesignated to S2C. And RAF aircraft were given various upgrades over the years. Self defense was improved by the addition of ANALQ 101 electronic countermeasures pod, uh, chaff and flare dispensers, and A9 Sidewinder capability. And RAF low level strike buccaneers could carry out what is known as, and I am quoting directly here, retard defense, and in this case, means four 1,000 pound retarded bombs carried internally could be dropped to provide an effective deterrent against any falling aircraft. Now in this case retarded bomb, uh, for those who aren't in the know and who might be just jumping in at this point, um, a retarded bomb is basically a bomb with a parachute and that's what they call them is a retarded bomb. Um, so in this case they're basically defending themselves by flying at super low level and dropping these bombs, so if an aircraft's trying to pursue them, the slowness of the bomb will let the dropping aircraft get out of range, and ideally, the bomb would go off under the aircraft behind it. Although that is obviously a very risky maneuver depending on how low you are. The parachute might not do much for you. In 1979, the RAF obtained the American AN AVQ 23E Pave Spike Laser Designator Pod for Pave with two laser guided bombs, allowing the aircraft to act as target designators for further Buccaneers, Jake Wards, and other strike aircraft. Huh, I didn't know that. I actually could have had a loadout of a pair of laser guided bombs and a designator. Well, the more you know. From 1986, number 208 Squadron RAF and number 12B Squadron replaced the Martell ASM with the Sea Eagle missile. Now, the Buccaneer was a mid-wing twin-engine aircraft with a crew of two in a tandem seat arrangement with the observer seated higher and offset from the pilot to give a clear view forward to enable him to assist in the visual search. Its operational profile included cruising at altitude for reduced fuel consumption before descending, just out outside the anticipated enemy radar detection range, 200 feet for a 500 knot dash to and from the target. 
Targets might be ships at sea or large shore-based installations at long range from the launching aircraft carrier. To illustrate a main AQ-66, an S-2 launch from the HMS Victorious in the Irish Sea performed a low-level simulated nuclear weapon toss on the airfield at Gibraltar and returned to the ship, a 2,300-mile trip. The aircraft had an all-weather operational capability provided by the pilot's head-up display and airstream detection detector, for example, and the observer's navigation systems and fire control. The Buccaneer was one of the largest aircraft to operate from British aircraft carriers and continued operating from them until the last conventional carrier was withdrawn in 1978. Carrying its service, the Buccaneer was the backbone of the Navy's ground strike operations, including nuclear strike. Now, this is the, oh yeah, we're flying RAF variant because we do not have a hook. That explains why I couldn't uh, set the carrier as my launch or recovery point uh, during uh, mission creation. I was a little afraid of that, and it looks like it's true, so uh, I guess we'll see if we can still land or not. The majority of the rear fuselage internal area was used to house electronics, such as elements of the radio, equipment supporting the aircraft's radar functionality, and the crew's liquid oxygen life support system, and the whole compartment was actively cooled by ram air drawn from the tail. For redundancy, the Buccaneer featured dual bus bars for electrical systems and three independent hydraulic systems. The aircraft was made easier to control and land via an integrated flight control computer that performed auto stabilization and autopilot functions. Now, while the Buccaneer had been designed specifically as maritime nuclear strike aircraft, its intended weapon was a nuclear air to surface missile codenamed Green Chase, but this weapon's development was canceled and in its place was the, two, the unguided 2,000 pound Redbeard, which had been developed for the English, the English Electric Canberra. Redbeard had an explosive yield in the 10 to 20 kiloton range and was mounted on a special bomb bay door into which it passed neatly to reduce aerodynamic buffet on the launch aircraft. At low levels and high speeds, traditional bomb, de bomb bay doors could not be opened safely into the airstream. Therefore, Blackburn developed the revolving bomb bay, which turned about the long axis of the aircraft, exposing the weapon low mounted on what was effectively the inside of a single bomb bay door, and allowing it to be released quickly without creating a massive increase in drag. This feature also proved convenient in providing ground level access, and unintentionally improved the aircraft's stealth capability by not generating a large increase in the radar cross section. The bomb bay could also accommodate a 2,000 liter ferry tank, a total reconnaissance crate, or a cargo container. The reconnaissance package featured an assortment of six cameras, each at different angles or having different imaging properties, and was only mounted on missions specifically involving reconnaissance activities. Buccaneer also featured four underwing hardpoints capable of mounting 1,000 pound bombs, missiles, fuel tanks, or other equipment such as flares. Later development saw the adoption of wing mounted electronic warfare and laser designator pods. A similar underwing configuration was laterally adopted by the South African Air Force. Upon its entry into service, the Buccaneer was capable of carrying practically all munitions then used by a Royal Navy aircraft. It was intended for a pack with twin 30mm Aiden cannons to be developed for the Buccaneer, but the effort was abandoned and the type was never equipped with a gun. Early on in the Buccaneer's career, conventional anti-ship missions would have employed a mix of iron bombs and rockets at close range. This tactic became increasingly impractical in the face of Soviet anti-aircraft missile advances. Thus, later Buccaneers were adopted, were adapted to make use of several missiles capable of striking enemy ships from a distance. The Anglo-French Martel missile was introduced upon the Buccaneer, but the weapon was said to have been very temperamental, and its deployment required an attacking Buccaneer. To increase its altitude and thus its vulnerability to being attacked itself. An extensive upgrade program undertaken in the 1980s added compatibility with several new pieces of equipment including the Sea Eagle missile, the self-guiding fire and forget missile capable of striking targets in an effective range of 60 miles. By time set of the Martel AJ-168 enemy ship missile while also being significantly more powerful. Alright, so throttling down. We're slowly descending to put us into um, a landing pattern here. Now, in order to improve the aerodynamic performance at slow speeds such as during takeoff and landing, Blackbeard like adopted a new aerodynamic control technology known as the Boundary Layer Control. BLC bled pressure air directly 
led high pressure air directly from the engines, which was blown against various parts of the aircraft's wing and surfaces. A full span slit across along part of the wing's trailing edge was found to give almost 50% more lift than any contemporary steel. And now I gotta stop reading because I gotta focus. And I'm sure that uh, that capability is not reflected in game, probably, or if it is just as general extra lift and not anything special. All right. There we are. Start laying her up. Okay, that should give us a little bit of time. In order to counteract the severe pitch movements that would otherwise be generated by the use of the BLC, a self-trimming system was interconnected with the BLC system. An additional blowing of the wind's leading edge was also introduced. The use of BLC allowed the use of slats to be entirely discarded in the design. Before landing, the pilot would open the BLC vents as well as lower the flaps to achieve slow, stable flight. The consequence of the blown wing was that the engines were required to run at high power for low speed flight in order to generate sufficient compressor gas for blowing. Blackburn's solution to this situation was the adoption of a large air brake. This addition allowed an overshooting aircraft to pull away more quickly during a failed landing attempt. Nose cone and radar antenna could also be swung by 180 degrees to reduce the length of the aircraft in the carrier hangar. The feature was particularly important due to the small size of aircraft carriers from which the Buccaneer tip the operated from. Alright, what's our speed now? Uh, yeah, I think a little fast, but I think we can, uh, I think we can deploy our landing gear. All right, so. I think we're sufficiently lined up now. And we are five miles out, so time to start reducing our thrust a little bit. For carrier takeoff, the Buccaneer was pulled tail down on the catapult with its nose wheel in the air to put the wing at about 11 degrees. It could be launched hands off. The pilot was able to leave the tailplane in a neutral position. With blowing on, the Spay 101 output drops to around 9,100 pounds force, though about 600 pounds force is recovered from the trailing edge slitch with space half. Alright. And you can see there the, uh, Maybe the RAF version had a smaller break, but... Alright. Let's, uh... Drop down further. I want to hit 180 knots. Then we should start seeing some dipping going on here. Alright. Looking good on the approach. Touchdown! Uh. Oh, break on, break on! Ah! Whoa. Can we do it? No. <laughs> Almost did it. So, that, yeah, that was kind of my fear is that, uh,. I accidentally turned the brake off. I didn't realize it was still on on my approach. I think I turned it off. If it was on on touchdown, we might have been able to stop uh, in time. But, yeah, unfortunately, we could not. And because they deprived us of our hook, we couldn't do a proper landing. Uh, anyways, off an aircraft carrier, the minimum launch speed was around 120 knots at 43,000 pounds from an airfield. Buccaneer took off in 3,000 feet at 144 knots with blown air. Figure it's become 3,700 feet at 175 knots without blown air. 
The fuselage of the Buccaneer was designed using the area roll technique, which had the effect of reducing aerodynamic drag while traveling at transonic speeds and gave rise to the characteristic curvy Coke bottle shape of the fuselage. The majority of the airframe and fuselage was machined from solid castings to give the required strength to endure the stress of low-level operations. Considerable effort went into ensuring that metal fatigue would not be a limiting factor of the Buccaneer's operational life even under the formidable conditions imposed of low-level fight. However, design changes for the Mark II Buccaneer, the addition of extended wingtips, and the position of a new bolt hole did cause fatigue problems leading to the loss of two aircraft. A large air brake formed the tail cone of the aircraft. The hydraulically operated air brake formed two leaves that could be opened into the airstream to quickly decelerate the aircraft. The style of air brake chosen by Blackburn was highly effective in the dive attack profile that the Buccaneer was intended to perform. Hey, so it, I guess it was supposed to do dive bombing. As well as effectively balancing out induced drag from operating the BLC system. It featured a variable incidence tailplane that could be trimmed to suit the particular requirements of low speed handling or high speed flight. The tailplane had to be high mounted due to the positioning and functionality of the Buccaneer's air brake. The wing design of the Buccaneer was a compromise between two requirements a low aspect ratio for good gust response and high aspect ratio to give good range performance. The small wing was suited to high speed flight at low altitude, however a small wing did not generate sufficient lift that was essential for carrier operations, therefore VLC was used upon both the wing and tailplane, having the effect of energizing and smoothing the boundary layer airflow which significantly reduced airflow separation at the back of the wing and therefore decreased stall speed and increased effectiveness of trailing edge control surfaces between flaps and air lines. And as you could see, we were very close to stopping when we fell off the carrier. So by going the full throttle, you could see how, even though it's not modeled in the game necessarily, we were able to hold that stall for a long time before we ended up hitting the, the water there. You know what would have helped is if I had jettisoned that 2,000 pound bomb I was still carrying when I uh, rearmed myself in the air, but oh well. <coughs> Operational history with the Fleet Air Arm The Buccaneer entered service with the Fleet Air Arm on the 17th of July 1962 when 801 Naval Air Squadron was commissioned at RNAS Lossiemouth in Scotland. The Buccaneer quickly replaced the FAA Supermarine Scimitar, which had previously been performing the naval attack role. In addition to conventional ordnance, the Buccaneer was cleared for nuclear weapons delivery in 1965. Weapons deployed included the aforementioned Redbeard and WE-177 freefall bombs, which were carried internally on a rotating bomb bay door. Two FAA operational squadrons and the training unit were equipped with the Buccaneer S-1. The aircraft was well liked by Navy aircrew for its strength and flying qualities, and the BLC system gave them slower landing speeds than they were accustomed to. The Buccaneers were painted dark sea gray on top and the anti-flash white on the other undersides. Deficiencies in the Buccaneer S1 Skyrim Jr. engines led to the type's career coming to an abrupt end in December 1970. On 1st of December, an S1 attempted to overshoot from a misjudged landing approach, but one engine surged and produced no thrust, forcing the two crewmen to eject. On the 8th of December, an S-1 on a training flight suffered a massive uncontained engine failure. The pilot successfully ejected, but due to a mechanical failure in his ejection seat, the navigator was killed. Subsequent inspections concluded that the Gyron Jr. engine was no longer safe to fly. All remaining S-1s were grounded immediately and permanently. By April 1965, intensive trials of the new Buccaneer S-2 had begun, with the type entering operational service with the FAA later that year. The improved S-2 type proved its value when it became the first FAA aircraft to make a non-stop, unrefueled crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. On the 28th of March 1967, Buccaneers from RNAS Lossiemouth bombed the shipwrecked supertanker Cory Canyon off the western coast of Cornwall to make the oil burn in an attempt to avoid an environmental disaster. In 1972, Buccaneers of 809 Naval Air Squadron operating from Ark Royal took part in a 1,500-mile mission to show a British military presence over British Honduras, now Belize, shortly before its independence to deter a possible Guatemalan invasion in pursuit of its territorial claims over the country. Buccaneer also participated in regular patrols and exercises in the North Sea, practicing the type's role if war had broken out with the Soviet Union. During the 1960s and 1970s, Royal Navy standardized air wings operating from their carriers around the Phantom, Buccaneer, and the Ferry Gannett aircraft. Those six FAA squadrons were equipped with the Buccaneer.
700 Bravo, 700 Zulu Intensive Flying Trials Unit, 736 Training, 800, 801, 803, and 809 Naval Air Squadrons. Buccaneers were embarked on HMS Victorious, Eagle, Ark Royal, and Hermes. The Buccaneer was retired from FAA service with the decommissioning in 1978 of the Ark Royal, the last of the Navy's fleet carriers. The retirement was part of a larger foreign policy agenda that was implemented throughout the 1970s. Measures such as the withdrawal of most British military forces stationed east of Suez were viewed as reducing the need for aircraft carriers and fixed-wing naval aviation in general. The decision was highly controversial, particularly to those within the FAA. The Royal Navy would replace the naval strike capability of the Buccaneer with the smaller Vestal capable, capable British, aerial, ugh, British Aerospace Sea Harrier, which were operated from their invincible aircraft carriers. Royal Air Force. After the General Dynamics F-111K was canceled in early 1968 due to the program suffering serious cost e escalation and delays, the RAF was forced to look for a replacement that was available and affordable and reluctantly selected the Buccaneer. The first RAF unit to receive the Buccaneer was 12 Squadron at RAF Huntington in October 1969 in the Maritime Strike Role. It at first equipped itself with ex-Royal Navy Buccaneer S-2As, um, 15 Squadron equipped with the Buccaneer fall the following year before moving to RAF Larbridge in 1971, and the RAF Buccaneer Conversion Unit, number 237 Operational Conversion Unit RAF forming at Huntington, formed at Huntington in March 1971. The Buccaneer was seen as an interim solution, but delays in the Panavia Tornado Program would ensure that the interim period would stretch out, and the Buccaneer would remain in RAF service for over two decades long after the FAA had given up the type. With the phased withdrawal of the Royal Navy's carrier fleet during the 1970s, the fleet air arms Buccaneers were transferred to the RAF, which had taken over the maritime strike role. 62 of the 84 S-2 aircraft were eventually transferred and redesignated S-2A. Some of these were later upgraded to the S-2B standard. Ex-FAA aircraft equipped 16 Squadron, joining 15 Squadron at Larbruch and 208 Squadron at Huntington. The last ex-FAA aircraft went to 216 Squadron. From 1970, with 12 Squadron initially, followed by 15 Squadron, 16 Squadron, number 237 OCU, 208 Squadron, and 216 Squadron, the RAF Buccaneer forces re-equipped with WE-177 nuclear weapons. At peak strength, Buccaneers equipped six RAF squadrons, although for only one year. More sustained strength of five squadrons was made up of three squadrons, 15, 16, and 208 squadrons, plus the number 237 OCU squadron, all assigned to Supreme Allied Commander Europe for land strike duties in support of land forces opposing Warsaw Pact forces in continental Europe, plus one squadron, squadron um, 12 squadron, assigned the Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic for maritime strike duties. Opportunities for Buccaneer squadrons to engage in realistic training were limited, and so when the U.S. began its red flag ex military exercises at Nellis Air Force Base in 1975, GRAF became keenly interested. The first red flag in which RAF aircraft were involved was in 1977, with 10 Buccaneers and two Avril Vulcan bombers participating. Buccaneers would be involved in later red flags through to 1983, and 1979 also participated in the similar maple flag exercise over Canada. The Buccaneer proved successful with its fast low-level attacks, which were highly accurate despite the aircraft's lack of terrain-falling radar and other modern avionics. They were able to penetrate adversary defenses and were credited with kills on defending fighters using AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles. During the 1980 red flag exercises, one of the partici participating Buccaneers lost the wing mid-flight due to a fatigue-induced crack and crash, killing its crew. The entire RAF Buccaneer fleet was grounded in February 1980. Subsequent investigation discovered serious metal fatigue problems to be present on numerous aircraft. A total of 60 aircraft were selected to receive new spar rings, while others were scrapped. The nascent 216 Squadron was subsequently disbanded due to a resulting reduction in aircraft numbers. Later the same year, the UK-based Buccaneer squadrons moved to RAF Lossiemouth in order to free space at Huntington for the tornado. In 1983, six Buccaneers S-2s were sent to Cyprus to support British peacekeepers in Lebanon as part of Operation Pulsator. On the 11th of September 1983, two of these aircraft flew 
blow over Beirut, their presence intended to intimidate insurgents rather than inflict damage directly. After 1983, the land strike duties were mostly reassigned to the Tornado aircraft then entering service, and two Buccaneer squadrons remaining, 12 Squadron and 208 Squadron, were then assigned to Sackland for maritime strike duties. Only the Shadow Squadron, number 237 OCU, remained assigned to the role of land strike on long term assignment to Sackier. Number 237 was also to operate as a designator for Jaguar ground strike aircraft in the event of conflict. The Buccaneer stood down from its reserve nuclear delivery duties in 1991. The Buccaneer took part in combat operations during the 1991 Gulf War. It had been anticipated that Buccaneers might need to perform in the target designation role, although early on this had been thought to be unlikely. Following a short notice decision to deploy, the first batch of six aircraft were ready to deploy in under 72 hours, including the adoption of desert camouflage and additional equipment, and departed from Lossy Mouth for the Middle Eastern Theater early on the 26th of January 1991. In theater, it became common for each attack formation to comprise four tornadoes and two buccaneers. Each buccaneer carried a single laser designator pod and acted as backup to the other in the event of an equipment malfunction. The first combat mission took place on the 2nd of February, operating at medium altitude of roughly 18,000 feet, and successfully attacked the Asuwaria Road Bridge. Operations continued on practically every available day. Missions did not take place at night, as the laser pod lacked nighttime functionality. Approximately 20 road bridges were destroyed by Buccaneer supported missions, restricting the Iraqi Army's mobility and communications. In conjunction with the advance of coalition ground forces into Iraq, the Buccaneers switched to airfield bombing missions targeting bunkers, runways, and any aircraft sighted following the guidance of the Tornado's laser-guided ordnance. The Buccaneer would commonly conduct dive bombing runs upon remaining targets of opportunity in the vicinity. In one incident on the 21st of February 1991, a pair of Buccaneers destroyed two Iraqi transport aircraft on the ground at Sheikha Mazar Airfield. Buccaneers flew 218 missions during the Gulf War, in which they designated targets for other aircraft and dropped 48 laser-guided bombs themselves. It had originally been planned for the Buccaneers to remain in service until the end of the 1990s, having been extensively modernized and process lasting up to 1989. The end of the Cold War, however, stimulated major changes in British defense policy, many aircraft being deemed surplus to requirements. It was decided that a number of Tornado GR-1s would be modified for compatibility with the Sea Eagle missile and take over the RAF's maritime strike mission, and the Buccaneer would be retired early. Squadrons operating the Buccaneer were quickly re-equipped with the Tornado. By mid-1993, 208 Squadron was the sole remaining operator of the type. The last Buccaneers were withdrawn in March 1994 when 208 Squadron disbanded. And... The other notable service life of the Buccaneer was with the South African Air Force. South Africa was the only country other than the UK to operate the Buccaneer, where it was in service with the SAAF from 1965 to 1991. In January 1963, even before the S-2 entered squadron service, South Africa had purchased 16 Spey-powered Buccaneers. The order was part of the Simonstown Agreement, in which the UK obtained use of the Simonstown Naval Base in South Africa in exchange for maritime weapons. An order for a further 20 Buccaneers was blocked by British Prime Minister Harold Wilson's government. In the maritime strike role, SAAF Buccaneers were armed with the French radio-guided AS-30 missile. In March of 1971, Buccaneers fired 12 AS-30s at a stricken tanker, the Wafira, but failed to sink it. The AS-30 missile was also used in ground attacks for effective precision strikes, one example being in 1981, when multiple missiles were used to strike a number of radar stations in southern Angola. For overland attack, the SAAF Buccaneers carried up to four 1,000-pound bombs in the rotary bomb bay and four bombs, flares, or SNEB rocket packs on the underwing stores pylons. During the 1990s, it was revealed that South Africa had manufactured six air-deliverable tactical nuclear weapons between 1978 and 1993. These nuclear weapons, containing highly enriched uranium with an estimated explosion yield of 10 to 18 kilotons, were designed for delivery by either the Buccaneer or the Canberra bomber. SAAF Buccaneer saw active service in the 1970s and 1980s during the South Africa border war, frequently flying over Angola and Nambia, launching attacks upon SWAPO guerrilla camps, and during a ground offensive, Buccaneers would often fly close air support missions armed with anti-personnel rockets, as well as performing bombardment operations. 
Buccaneers played a major role in the Battle of Kasinga in 1978, being employed in repeated strikes upon armored vehicles, including enemy tanks, and they covered the withdrawal of friendly ground forces from the combat zone. Buccaneer was capable of carrying heavy loadouts over a long range and could remain in theater for longer than other aircraft, making it attractive for the close air support role. On the 3rd of January 1988, Buccaneers of the SADF destroyed the important bridge across the Coito River using a Raptor glide bomb. Falling on from a less successful attempt on the 12th of December 1987. Only five aircraft remained operational by the time the Buccaneer was retired from service in 1991. Early in the Buccaneer program, the U.S. Navy had expressed mild interest in the aircraft but quickly moved on to the development of the more powerful A6 Intruder. The West German Navy showed a greater interest and considered replacing its Hawker Seahawks with the type, though it eventually decided on the Lockheed F-104G for its maritime strike requirement following the bribing of West German government officials in the Lockheed bribery scheme. So, as far as variants go, you have the Blackburn NA-39, which was a pre-production build, the aforementioned Buccaneers S-1 and S-2, the S-2A, which were modified S-2s for the Royal Air Force, the S-2B, which I believe was a new build, uh, for the Air Force and roughly equivalent to the S-2A. Um, Buccaneer S-2C was, as, was Royal Navy aircraft upgraded to the S-2A standard. And the Buccaneer S-2D, which was Royal Navy aircraft upgraded to the S-2B standard. And you have the Buccaneer S-50, which was the variant for South Africa. There is currently... Uh, one Buccaneer that has been rebuilt to flying condition by Hawker Hunter Aviation. And five Buccaneers are in fact fast taxiing condition. <laughs> as far as the general characteristics, had a crew two was 19.33 meters long, 13 meters wide um, with the wingspan, and was 4.95 meters high. Had an empty weight of 30,000 pounds and a gross weight of 62,000 pounds and was ultimately powered by the Rolls-Royce Spey, as mentioned earlier, with a maximum speed of 580 knots, or about Mach 0.95, at a range of 2,000 nautical miles and a service ceiling of 40,000 feet, and a thrust-to-weight ratio of 0.36. And while it lacks the cannon that uh, <laughs> we have in the game, it could be... It had four underwing pylon stores for up to 12,000 pounds of bombs, and an internal rotating bomb bay with a capacity of 4,000 pounds of bombs, rockets, missiles, or other things like ECM protection pods, uh, the pace bike laser designator, etc. And that is it for the Blackbeer, Blackburn Buccaneer. It was a bit of a longer episode because they had, actually had a very long history and saw some combat service as opposed to some of the other types we've discussed on here. But I think that will do it now for today's episode. So with that, thank you all for watching and stay tuned for next time and stay safe out there and we'll see you then.